Good morning. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the chance to be here together, to assemble as, as a school, to praise you, to sing your praises, to think about your glory, to consider our goal, to be with you, to be pleasing to you, to give you glory. Our Father in heaven, fill our hearts with thankfulness, for calling us to this place, for being with one another, and most especially for being under your government and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise together and sing. The, the challenge of uh, reading a very a learned man like, like Junius is that, that he sees uh, through experience, uh, Junius when he wrote this was a little older than, than me at the end of a very long and varied career in politics and, and law, who had, had studied uh, extensively all through his his life as a, a university professor, uh, had been involved in both active uh, controversies of politics and, and law. Of course, he began his life as a law student, uh, had been involved in diplomacy, had been involved in the full affairs of society, albeit from the position of a scholar, mainly. And so he's somebody who considers the beginning of things as a scholar. He considers the most general things, the most foundational things. Uh, but he also sees things all the way through to the, to the end. And so uh, when we try to, to follow him, we tend to adopt one perspective or, or another. But Junius is very focused uh, on the extensive picture, the, the full uh, circle from the center to the, to the outsides. And particularly, he sees that a small beginning, uh, excuse me, a small error in the beginning produces very, very, very large mistakes at the, at the end. If I set out for a destination uh, and I'm off by just a few, a few degrees, at the beginning, I won't be very far off course. But by the end of a long trip, I will be very, very, very far off course. A very small error in direction at the beginning of walking for a few hours will lead you miles and miles and miles off, off course. And so uh, we, tend to grow, uh, we tend to grow eager and anxious and want to hasten on to the end. Uh, whereas a man like a Junius sees that the end that we reach is going to be determined by the, the precision of the beginning that we, we make. And so, uh, just as when we learn the, the law, we begin with very basic categories. The distinction between uh, torts and contracts. We would never want to confuse those things. We would never want to say that torts is contracts or contracts is torts. That would be obscene, <laughs> ridiculous. Um, we, we begin with very basic distinctions. The difference between public and private law. Uh, very simple distinctions between causes of action. And then we can use those for the rest of our life. We, we use them very, very, very practically. Uh, when you're, you're a lawyer and you're, you're hearing a client uh, describe his case, you move through the categories, the simple categories that you've learned, and it helps guide you as you determine practical courses of action. And the very simplicity of it uh, enables you very quickly and rapidly to, to steer yourself in the right, in the right way. So many of the distinctions that um, Junius is making, if you go to the first slide, as we discussed last week, they're very simple, first slide please, thank you, uh, very simple analytic distinctions. Trivial, I mean actually trivial distinctions. All law is either eternal or not eternal. Okay, it's also all laws either concern broccoli or they don't concern broccoli. That's equally, equally true, equally undeniable. All laws either concern cats or they don't concern cats, right? I mean, it's true. Uh, the, 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 the value of that distinction is gonna have to be shown later, but we can admit it's truth. Uh, we're concerned as a law school about this distinction because by the eternal law, what is eternal? There's only one thing that's eternal, not a thing, a person, God, our Lord, uh, the one from whom all comes, that's it. That's eternal. We know he exists. We know he cares about from the scriptures. We know he cares about the affairs of men. 
We know that legal systems are not outside his control, but within them, that right laws come about through agreeing with the will of God and false laws disagree with the will of God. We know all these things from the, the scriptures, so we can leap forward to the end and see this is a good distinction to make. This is a very fundamental distinction. People who deny that there's God, people who deny that there's a source of meaning, value, good, right, justice outside of the passing affairs of the world. Everything in the world is changing. Uh, you change every day. The environment changes every day. Things change. Governments change. Everything changes. Opinions change. If there's nothing outside that realm of time and of becoming and of passing away, that has very large effects in the way you view things in the end. It's a very good opening distinction to make. Uh, the, all laws are either eternal, the way that God presents himself as a measure, the way that God in his love and his excellence uh, demands from us, it, it commands us to return to him and enjoy his, his love, that turns out to be a very good place to start. But that's not what he's doing yet. Just admit the distinction. All laws are either eternal or not eternal. If they're in time, if they're not eternal, well, where could laws ar arise from in time? They either arise according to the nature of a thing or not according to the nature of a thing. Again, it's logically trivial. In time, all laws either arise from people named Fred or they don't. All laws either arise from people named John or they don't. Some laws arise from people named John, others don't. That would be an equally valid distinction, but it wouldn't be as interesting as observing that, that uh, things have natures and uh, some commands are going to be upon us from our natures and others are not. It's a valuable distinction in the end, but at the beginning, to accept it, you just need to know well, it's obviously true. Of things in time, they will either arise from their nature or, or not. At the end, we're going to talk a lot, as we already have, about natural law and the way our human nature dictates certain things to us. That's going to be important. But, but right now, just accept the logical derivation. Of things that don't arise from nature, they have to come to nature. They have to, as Junius puts it, advene. They have to happen to nature. And he says, if you think about the nature of, of law, law is a rational command. It has to come from someone rational. It has to appeal to someone rational. That's what we mean by law, he says. Okay, there are two places that could come from, God or man. Those are the two rational alternatives. Or if you want to think of it this way, uh, and this is the way he, he promotes the, the argument, he says, look, um, of things that come to man, they could either be concerned with goods, the common good that is natural to man, or that is beyond his nature. All the, the laws that, that happen to man, all the laws that come from outside of his nature, must either be concerned with his own nature, goods that are natural to him, how to achieve them, for example. If we want to get from Seoul to Pohong faster, we should build a KTX. That's a human good. Or if we want to return to God who made us, if we want forgiveness of sins, if we want eternal glory, if we want eternal life, that is something that is beyond our nature. We don't have the capacity to do it. We, we don't have the wisdom to do it. That's something beyond our, our nature. And so he says, look, of the things that come to man, either they concern, the common good that they concern is beyond our nature, or appropriate to our nature, within our powers, within what is natural to us. And this is a, you know, this he says, this is the chart of all laws. You should memorize it. I mean, it's very simple. There's eternal law. These are the categories of law, just as we have battery, assault, false imprisonment, intentional affliction of emotional distress, trespass to chattels, trespass to land, conversion. Now you've done all the intentional torts, okay? You can do all the laws. There's eternal law. There is natural law. There is divine law. And there's human law. And you know how to generate this. If you need to generate it, you can do it very simply. 
was either eternal or not eternal. If it's not eternal, it's adventitious. It comes to nature. What kinds of things, uh, excuse me, if it's not eternal, it's either natural or it comes to nature. It's adventitious. If it's adventitious, it either comes from God or comes from man, corresponds to our supernatural ends or not to our supernatural ends, namely our natural ends. It's very easy to, to generate. It's a simple dialectic. The value of it comes when after studying law and arguing law and being involved in many, many kinds of debates. Junius was a Bible translator. He was a pastor thinking about biblical law. It comes at the end when you see how effective these categories are in differentiating things that need to be distinguished. These are things that need to be distinguished from each other because God as a law is very different than human law. Natural law is very different than human law. All these things need to be distinguished from each other because sometimes we use the word law indiscriminately. We use it in a confusing way and people get confused and they think they should treat human law like eternal law or they should treat natural law like they do human law. And this is basic jurisprudential stuff. How do we think generally about the law? Now, of course, Junius is, we're aiming towards reading the Mosaic Law, and we're going to begin that next week. But this works everywhere. This works for, for all, all kinds of law as well. Next slide, please. This is the same slide, but, but it has prettier colors. That's for you guys who, who have different learning styles. For people who like learning with color, this slide is, is for you. Next slide. Remember, uh, as we discuss the law and define the law, however, as we begin to move to the outside of the circle and see the consequences of this, an additional move that we, we do is we see that although we can derive these categories, when we try to explain the categories and define them, we find that they're in a, in a relationship of derivation from one another. The order of logic by, just, by which we go eternal, not eternal, natural, not natural to a natural end or to a supernatural end, that is not a, a full understanding of these categories because they, they derive from one another. Eternal law, by which we mean God in his aspect, in the aspect in which to know God would be to seek him, to obey him, to conform ourselves to what is glorious and, and good. Um, is very distinct from natural law, by which we just mean our very limited participation through our own natures, through the way God made us, in the eternal law. When we reflect on our own natures and think, ah, we're created, God made us in this way, he made us this way for a reason, our natures become a command to us. The, the good of our natures is not just there like something I personally choose, it's given to me as a command. What I, what I know about myself as created by God is different than if I just think I'm the universe. If I'm the universe, I do whatever I want. But if something is made for me by another, if someone gives me something and gives me the capacity to understand the design that he's made, then he makes it for me to understand and for me to use as he made it. The natural law is very distinct from the eternal law. The eternal law is God. He is, he is beyond all things. He's the measure of all, all measures. The natural law is my nature measuring me because of, of what I, I am. The natural law arises within me, but because of sin, because quite frankly, many times when I'm, I have a temptation before me or I'm filled only with thoughts of myself, I don't think of my nature as given to me by God. I don't think about uh, what God has, has given to me and how I should use it in accordance with his will, what my nature suggests about God's will. I think about myself. I make a universe unto myself and I act any way I want. Uh, because of the fall, natural law operates very badly within me. And so we have another law. The divine law, God in his great grace and love, gives us a divine law for two reasons. One, so that we can understand that we are not simply ordered to this world. We are, we, although we are ordered by our nature, 
We have a goal beyond our nature. Although uh, we, cannot, we are not uh, purely spiritual beings, we have a spiritual destiny that's based not on our worth or our value, but on God's love, God's desire to draw us up uh, to him. And also because a basic way that we're supposed to understand God's love for us is to understand we should have understood through natural law what was right for us and seen that we were sinning. But because we suppress that truth, because we hide from our own natures, God gives us a law so that we can understand the natural law and understand our own sinfulness, understand how far we depart from God's plan for us. God made us for an eternal spiritual destiny of, of love forever with him, of righteousness and truth, but we have turned away from that, and God inspires a law in his prophets and infuses that law in us so that we can return to our, our sense. So the, the main point of divine law uh, Junia says, whether there was a fall or not, whether we had problems with natural law or not, would be to lift us up to a supernatural end, to guide us to our supernatural end. If Adam hadn't fallen in the garden, still God spoke to him. Still God gave him law. God put him in relationship with himself. He walked with him and spoke with him. Um, he gave him commands. Uh, God, in any case, man's natural powers are not sufficient to lead us to the eternal law. But, uh, although that's the primary end of law, when we look at human law, we're also interested in another aspect of divine law. Because we're so bad at natural law today, because we're so confused, because we mix up right and wrong, because we, we, we make horrible mistakes, you may have done this in your life, you may look back at something you did and said, I was really confused about what was right or wrong to do in this situation, and I really blew it. Um, because we're confused, another aspect of divine law that's really important is God wants us to understand how much we need him. How much, even though we've sinned against him and rebelled against him, how great his grace is that he comes to us, and so he teaches us right from wrong so that we can understand his love, understand his mercy even, even better. And so natural law and divine law pour together as sources in establish the right principles for, for human law. But Junius says it's really important to understand the distinction between natural law and divine law and human law is really important to make. God didn't create man like the, the animals to be ruled either by by nature alone. He didn't create us by the animal, like the animals to be guided by, by man. He gave us the role of making laws. Making laws is proper to us. It's something that needs to be done. And that's because of the specificity of things. We have two problems when we try to make human laws, understanding justice correctly. What is it? What is just? What is right? But another problem we have is once you know what's right, you have to apply that to particular conditions. So the conditions of land vary, conditions of the character of peoples vary, conditions of technology vary, many things vary, and we have to make determinations about that. And Junia says you can't reduce that to natural or divine law. You can't reduce it because there are certain determinations which aren't dependent upon human nature. A oh, classic example, natural law may tell us that when we uh, run societies, we should be very careful that people don't die needlessly. And natural law might even tell us that uh, if you're going to have systems of, of traffic, you should make sure that people don't run into each other and die. But whether you have people drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road is in no way determined by natural law. The, the, they're equivalent in outcome with respect to the natural law. They keep people from head-on collisions. There are determinations that have to be made by human authorities, and we need to obey them to, to bring us all into an orderly system that can by no means simply be derived from the natural law. There are, there are determinations which are specific as opposed to general, and so with respect to those specificities, we, uh, we are uh, undetermined by natural law. The divine law helps us in this, as we'll see 
in the weeks to come because we have one great example, one example without error of a, a law that conforms to man's nature uh, as it's applied to particular circumstances. That's the, the judicial laws of, of the Jewish people given by, by Moses. So we have a school to learn from in the way that God did it for the Israelites, how he took the general principles of right that we read in the Ten Commandments. He said, uh, don't murder. Junie says, that's a principle of, of natural law. But he gave it specificity. Specificity, determinations like, how much evidence do you need to convict someone of murder? What should the punishment be for murder? What should the process be for punishing a murderer? Should you kill him right away? If it's obvious murder, or should you allow him to run to a city of refuge and have a trial? How many witnesses do you need? One, two, three? All of these kinds of determinations that are made in, in the law. In, in no way can those be simply derived from, from the, the natural law. They are, they are undefined because the natural law is general, and these questions are, are specific. Next slide, please. I don't want to talk about this. That slide's way too complicated. <laughs> Let's go on to the next slide. So just to, to sort of leap ahead for a second and anticipate, I, this is in you, the introduction I, I wrote for you. Um, if you go all the way to the end and you look at the outcome of, of thousands of years of, of human thought, you can see that very basic errors, either denying that one of these categories of law exists or confusing the categories, uh, more or less defines, you can use it to define and understand the errors of all the aberrant, false teachings about law that are made in the modern world. What I, what I want you to see with this slide is, by memorizing this very simple uh, taxonomy, which is easily logically derivable, and which uh, is, you can draw out of the scriptures that there's an eternal law, that there's a, a natural law, that there's a divine law, that there's a human law. You can do it very easily. If you do these things, you have a basic structure of topics. Just like if you're trying to figure out what kind of intentional wrong it is, you just run through the list. Is it battery? Is it assault? Is it false imprisonment? Et cetera, et cetera. So too, if you're thinking about a, a legal school, somebody talking about law, in a way that seems contrary to the scripture, but you can't quite put your finger on it, you have a number of errors that are very simple and easy to recall that you can think about, well, which error is being made here? It's got to be one of the following errors. You're either denying a category of law or you're confusing a category of, of law. So, I mean, think about it. It's very simple. Lots of people today deny that there's an eternal law. They deny that there's anything out of the, the realm of material being that gives it order, that gives it value. They deny an eternal law because if you admit that there's something eternal that has a different nature than this world, your thoughts will very quickly lead you to something that sounds a lot like God. It's unchanging. It's, it's before all things. It, it gives the shape and value and meaning to all things. It creates all things. It itself is unchanging. All things are directed to it, and it directs all things. We, we live in a world that's largely rejected the eternal law. We live in a world, that is to say, of atheistic, which just means God-denying. Atheistic, the theology is theism. Atheistic means denying God. Atheistic relativism where you say it's impossible for there to be one thing above all else because there's nothing outside this world, and everything in this world is just relative to another thing. There's no hierarchy within the world. It's just a flat plane, and things have relations, but everything is relative to something else. When we talk about a judgment of something, we can in no way derive that judgment from something in another dimension because there is no other dimension. There's just a material world. There's no God. And so you face the situation of atheistic relativism. You know, in the 19th century, everybody talked about this. It was the first sort of mass movements of atheism that led to, to Marxism and modern totalitarianisms. And everybody would just go, wait a second, if there's no God, 
Well then, of course, there's no absolute values. If there's no absolute values, the only reason not to murder someone or commit adultery or do what you want is because you're afraid of punishment. You have a relation to someone else of fear. So cowards obey the law when there's something they want well enough to take what they have. All talk of honor, decency, right, wrong, is just a way that we, we create fantasies to compel people to do things. If there's not really God, then all of this is just talk, and you should do whatever you can get away with. Very basic error. You deny that there is a God who rules and cares about the world and, and orders it, and you end up with atheistic relativism. Okay? Uh, also, we have a very a popular school. Some people admit there's God, but they say law. Well, law is just what governments posit. That's all it is. It's what governments lay down. Law isn't in any way derivable from natural law, because even if there is a God, there's, there's no intermediate form. We have no rational participation in God. Our nature doesn't tell us anything about what it is we should do. Uh, Professor Gould was talking about, about Darwinism on, on Tuesday. Darwinism is a, a classic I example of an argument that's made, well, yeah, men exist, but they're, they're just part of natural processes. They have no plan. They have no order. They're just an emergent phenomenon. They'll change in turn. Um, and so some people react to this by going, law is just law. It's just what the government says it is. There's no way that we can get from man's nature to God. There's no relationship between them. Man has from God no sense of direction or purpose. Against Romans 1, for example, that quite clearly teaches that man knows God's eternal decrees and knows because of his sinfulness that he deserves punishment. Uh, these people say, nope, law has no, there, there's no intermediate relationship between man and the law. There's no natural work that man is, is leading forth that has any determination of what our laws should be. Lots of people reject divine law. They, they say, uh, and I'm speaking of divine law predominantly in uh, the sense of they deny that there's any need for a correction of our, of our mental uh, limits because of the fall. So the, the plain teaching of Scripture is man suppresses the truth. Man has the truth in a sense, but he suppresses it. I always use the example, you know you should be studying, but instead you watch a movie with your friends or, or play, uh, you know, Galaxy. I don't know what game you play. You play some game, right? You know you should be studying, but uh, you suppress that truth and you, you waste your time playing a video game. All right? You're, you're familiar with this, this phenomenon. And there are people, and a convenient name for them is rationalists, who say, contrary to the scripture and contrary to our need for natural law, that man knows everything he needs to know through his own reason. Rationalism is not the belief in reason. Rationalism is the belief in the adequacy of reason, the sufficiency of reason against any form of outside authority or uh, aid or assistance. And the world has been very rationalistic. Rather, the world today uh, basically says, yeah, we can get along with our reason just fine. Um, not only does it deny natural law, but it, it could at least go, there is no natural law, or excuse me, there is no divine law, there is no help from God, and we're lost. It's a big problem. But no, it says, there's no divine law, and we're okay. We're doing just fine figuring out what's right and wrong without divine law. We're doing just fine ordering ourselves to ends without a supernatural end. And, uh, you know, I think that's wrong, but a good name for it is, is rationalism. And rationalism in law is very common. The, the, this is a, a teaching of the 18th century, continues on in, in many different ways, but we need nothing else. We need nothing else than our reason to determine uh, the law. Finally, another major, another major error 
is those who deny that there is a human law. They deny that there's any valid ordering by reason of man for the common good. You can do this by many ways. You can deny that there's a common good for man. There's no such thing as a common good for man. Every law, this is basically a version of Marxism, every, every law simply prefers one group over another. There's no common project of mankind that we could unite around. It's always, it's always dog versus dog. There's no way of, of linking us in harmony. There's no God to create us as a race and make us have a, a possibility of living together in harmony. We are fundamentally at conflict with one another. Or you can deny that it's possible for one person to have the authority to make laws. How can one person have authority to make law for another person? We're all equal, therefore no one can make law. Even if we need law, you couldn't make it. Um, or you could deny that man has reason. You could say, we have no reason, we, we're, we're, we're just animals. We need to be managed like animals. There's no laws, there's just biological control of people, the way people were managed in concentration camps. You treat them like animals, you keep them in cages, you use beatings uh, to control them, not even language, okay? So very, four basic categories of law, and you could, you could name these errors differently, but these seem to me a, a good way of, of seeing to the end of this project. What is this project that Junius is doing about? We make these kind of divisions to avoid horrendous errors. We affirm that there's a, an eternal law. We affirm that there's a natural law. We affirm that there's a divine law. We affirm that there's a, a human law because the alternative is relativism. The alternative is positivism. The, the alternative is rationalism. The alternative is anarchy. Anarchy is just the denial that there's any, any order. And again, in the 19th century, there were lots of anarchists. They, they said if we just got rid of human laws, we would all be better off. We would live in a true natural society. We would be better off because there's really no such thing as, as law. So that's one kind of error you could make. You could deny a basic category of, of law. This is a very useful thing to do. When you're talking to somebody and they start saying crazy things about, about law, a simple thing to do is say, well, are they denying eternal law? Are they divine, denying natural law? Are they denying divine law? Are they denying human law? Very basic structure of possible errors. Then another possible thing they could do is they could admit basically that these things exist, but they could confuse them. They could combine categories that are properly separate. This is why Junius makes the distinctions that he makes, but then he explains how things are distinguished one from another. And if you, if you mess this up and you push part of one into another, then you reach a, a very different uh, a very different. Uh, end. So, for example, if you say, yes, there's an eternal law, man is what there is. Man is like God. Man is the ultimate value. Man and his nature are what are eternal. Man and his nature are the end and order of things. Man creates all things. You end up with a, a, a school of thought, uh, the rationalist school of, of thought, that places man as the center of, of value. We're very much in this phase of, of global civilization right now. We have a high faith in reason. We have a high faith in ourselves. We make man and his values the, the center and order of existence. We're humanists. We, we believe in ourselves. We, we confuse what we understand about our natures and our sense of obligation from our own natures with the eternal law. We, we treat ourselves as self-creating entities, having rights of control, and we make our, our desires and our values the essence of, of things. Another thing you could do is you could confuse the divine law with eternal law. This is the mistake of, of the Pharisees that Jesus talks about. The, the divine law, as Junius points out in today's reading, is not God. The divine law is God's best expression, it's our best expression to us of what the eternal law is. It's our best expression of who God is. But we don't read the Bible 
to read the Bible. Our, our goal in hearing the gospel and receiving the good news through the scriptures is not to read the Bible, it's to be with God. Our, 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 when we hear the gospel, we don't hear the gospel for the sake of the sound it makes on our ears or the appearance of, of the letters on the text or even the logical significance of, of the gospel, the, the beauty of its conceptual structure. That's not salvation. Salvation is reconciliation with the eternal law, even, even God. The, the Pharisees knew the scriptures very well, but they didn't know them as divine law. That is to say, something teaching us a way to God. We could confuse human law with eternal law. This is a very common thing in the 20th century. The state is God in history, Hegel wrote. The state is God. There's no higher being than the state. The state uh, is, is it. The, the progress of the state. This is why they wanted world government. They wanted all humanity under one, under one God. And you see the outcome of this in totalitarian societies where they say becoming a proper member of the state is our goal. Just as we would say, union with God, atonement with God, at one with God is our goal, they would say there's no higher goal than being a member of the state. That's it. That's as high as it goes. And because of that, the state has the right to total control. The state has the right to govern the totality of your life because there's no good beyond the state. There, there's no intervening or higher order of, of value. Or you could confuse natural law with divine law. This is secular humanism, which says, yeah, we, we know from our natures very, very, very well what our, our goals are. We, we, we believe in natural law. We believe that our natures tell us what we should do. But we get it. We don't need any divine law. We should abolish divine law because we don't need it. We don't need to refer to divine law because we understand what it is that we should, we should do. We can confuse natural law with human law. This error would, would mean that you say there should be natural law and that should suffice for human law. And so you take the things that you know from human law, there should be contracts should be enforced, there should be property, uh, there should be marriage, there should be prohibitions on theft, and you say the state can only properly do what natural law immediately teaches. And this is the, basically the effort of liberalism in the 18th century, was to say law should go no further at all than natural law. We should reduce law down to what we immediately know by nature, there's no ground for human authority, all the laws should simply be limited to what natural law teaches us. And this was in large measure a rebellion against human authorities caused, sadly, by the abuses of human authorities, but it leads to its own kind of, its own kind of, of errors. There's another confusion we could make. We could think, well, it's not natural law that should be the only law. It's divine law that should be the only law. There's no human law. Divine law is human law. And uh, very over the history of the church, uh, there have sadly been some heretical sects, some divisions that said, um, if, it's, if it's not in the scriptures, it can't be a law. Or they've taken the law of the garden or the law of the kingdom to come and said, because we're Christians, we can do this now. So you had groups like the Anabaptists who read the New Testament and said, okay, because Christians should share with one another, the state should abolish property. Because Christians should be generous with each other, therefore uh, the state should take everybody's money and distribute it like a church charitable, charitable fund. This is not what we call Baptists today. This was a radical group during the Reformation, the Anabaptists. Um, and they did all sorts of crazy things. I mean, really crazy things. If you want to read about it, read about Munster and uh, the, the revolutionary takeover. It was, a, it was like Christian communists today, Christians who have been so warped in their thinking 
that they support communism. Uh, the city of Munster was turned into a communist commune because they claimed that they were applying the law of Christ to society, that there was no legitimate ground for Christians to have a human law, and they did a terrible, crazy, crazy things. So all I've done is moved from a reminder of the very simple dialectical work of these categories and tried to remember, remind you what the practical outcome and use of these categories would be. You can think about a variety of errors as corresponding to denial or confusion of these simple categories. And just as we as lawyers use very simple conceptual schemes and we work them up to very effective practical tools, so too you can use these. So too you can check your, your own thinking, so too you can stimulate your desire to understand, well, what is exactly, what do we mean by eternal law? What do we mean by natural law, divine law, human law? By understanding how these things are related to great, great, great errors in, in the end. Uh, these terms are perfectly adequate terms. They're, they're d easily derivable. They uh, connect well with the scriptures. You could think of them by other names. You could describe them in, in different ways. But these four kinds of divisions really are excellent conceptual uh, places to divide our thinking about law and errors in them really do lead to great and significant differences. So uh, if, you, if you want a, a recapsulation of that, you could read over the introduction I wrote to today's reading, which I, again tried to, to provide the same sort of explanation for you of why are we doing this kind of basic conceptual work? What is, what is the point of, of this? Once we've, once we've made these divisions, what's the outcome of it? In the rest of the semester, the outcome of it is going to be showing how people can make errors by thinking that the Mosaic law is simply one law and not understanding the structure of the eternal law, the natural law, the divine law, and human law. Not understanding that when we talk about law, we can make a mistake if we think it's only of one kind or source, that it has only one goal or, or meaning, that rather law must, must relate to, human laws must relate to natural law and divine law and be related to the, to the eternal law. Uh, today, then, we, we got our final definitions of uh, divine law. And again, his emphasis in divine law is on its, the predominant purpose of God in giving us scriptures. Why does God inspire prophets to write scripture? Why does he infuse scripture within us? And he says, because God wants something for us far beyond our natural capacities to attain for ourselves and far beyond our, particularly our fallen capacities, to understand how to do it. If, if you've ever been in a sinful, shameful situation with another person where you've wronged them, you've done something wrong to somebody, and there's no way to undo the wrong, but you desperately desire reconciliation, but you don't know how to do it, this is the situation of man without divine law. We, we don't know how to reconcile ourselves to the one who's made us, to the one who judges us, because we have wronged him. We have turned away from him. Uh, one thing that people do when they've wronged someone else and they don't know how to reconcile or fix the situation is they get mad at that person. They come up with a story about why the other person is really the bad guy. I'm not the bad guy. They were asking to be punched. They've got a punchable face. They're annoying. It's their fault I punched him. Why did you make me punch you? People do say, say and really think crazy things. Mankind can do one of two things without divine law in relationship to, to God. We can despair or we can rebel. We can get angry with God. We can try to ignore God. Some people do this when they've wronged someone. They just try to forget about the wrong that they've done. And that may work for a while until their conscience uh, upsets them. But we do all these things with God. Some people try to ignore them. Some people get, 
get mad at them, some people despair. Uh, but God's answer is the divine law that calls us through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through his bearing our sins, by his showing his great love for us, of dying for us while we were yet sinners, how much he loves us and drawing us to an end of eternal life with him that we couldn't imagine that God would love us. Who, who could imagine that God would love us so much that God would want to dwell with us and abide with us and illuminate us and care for us and, and love us? And even if you could imagine such a thing on your own, how would you attain to it? How, how, would, you, how would you do this? You, you wouldn't know. And this is why, why Christ, his name, his life, his death, his resurrection is, is revealed uh, to us. So this is the, the, the great weight and gravamen that, that, that uh, Junius puts on the divine law. The divine law is given to us because natural law is clearly incapable. Our natures, reflection on our own natures, even as given to us by God, are insufficient to lead us to God. Even if we weren't fallen, but particularly because we're, we're fallen, nature can't go beyond nature. There has to be something beyond nature that's given to us. Uh, and this is why throughout history, throughout, uh, throughout time, uh, men have been looking for revelation. And this is, I, I'm always amazed when I go to, a, a, I used to go to the, the, the store in the mall here in Pohong, and there would be people doing tarot cards. They would be telling fortunes with, with tarot cards. Uh, because man naturally desires some voice from outside because he doesn't know what he needs to, to know. And so mankind reaches out for the silliest things. The stars tell us the, the future. The stars tell us what to do. Birds tell us what to do. Uh, the Romans used to sacrifice animals and look at their liver. You, you reach into a dead animal, pull out its liver, and you would look at the shape of the liver, and you would understand God's will for you. Man is so desperate for something outside of his own failing capacities, which he recognizes, that he will adopt this craziest things. And so God gave us true revelation so that we might be, we might be guided. Um, also, to do that, Junius says, God tells us a lot about the natural law. He tells us about what is eternally right and wrong. The Bible tells us God didn't just make up what's right and wrong on the spot. It's always been right and wrong. He's reminding us of what's right and wrong. He's clarifying it for us for two reasons, so that we can understand our sin. And once we've recovered from our sin through the gospel, then so that we can be guided into righteousness of, of life. So in the course of setting us on a supernatural end, God also clarifies the natural law in, in scriptures. Uh, Junius, Junius says. Junius turns then to a human law. And again, he is really emphatic. It's super important not to deny human law. It's possible to get so caught up in how great divine law is and so caught up in natural law that you forget it is essential to our dignity. It's essential to working out our, our chief human project that we make human laws. Human laws are, are not just made by reflecting on the natural law and saying that's the natural law, now do it. Humans have work to do. Uh, just as our life on the earth is not just looking around the world and enjoying its beauty, we add to its beauty, we contribute to its glory, we have a, a proper work for us. Part of that proper work is taking the general truths that God has, has given us and applying them to our specific circumstances. We have a real function. It's, it's not only that God governs the world, God delights to govern the world through his creatures. He, he, it is part of God's great plan, not only that he will govern the world, but he will give charge and responsibility to his creatures to govern the world. What the government of the world would have been like without the fall, we can only imagine. We, we uh, err in our responsibilities to God in many ways, but they don't go away. Because of sin, we're not the, the children to our parents. We're not the spouses to our husband or wife. We're not the friends that we, we want to be, but we still have these obligations. We still have these duties. 
Because of the fall, we're not the rulers of one another that we'd like to be, but we still have obligations. And we don't, we don't achieve that better by pretending there isn't a specific calling and, and task for, uh, for humans in making laws. He says that task is twofold. The first one is to derive the proper notions of right and wrong from the natural law and the divine law. We, we study the natural law, we study the divine law to make sure we have the right principles. And then we draw certain necessary conclusions from those principles that are logical conclusions. So he says, we know we don't want to be murdered, and so we conclude we shouldn't murder other people. We know we don't want other people to be murdered, and so we conclude there should be some sort of deterrent for murder. There should be some kind of punishment. So far, so good. It's very difficult to understand the principles. It's difficult to draw the necessary conclusions. But then there's something that has nothing to do with simple logic at all. What should the punishment be for murder? Where should people who have murdered punish, be punished? Should they be punished distinctively from thieves? If, if, if we're going to punish them, what else should we do with them while they're being punished? What should we call this to excite horror in it? There's a million determinations which by no principle could you decide it through abstract reason. Uh, this is a, a, a far cry from some of the legal rationalists in the 20th and 19th century who said the whole system could be worked out uh, rationally. He says, no, there's important parts of human law which rest solely on the wisdom and prudence of human authorities. So to conclude, uh, Junius wants, as we've seen through his logical taxonomy, he has two modes here. He just says, hey, it's either eternal or not eternal. If it's not eternal, it's either natural or it's not natural. It's adventitious. If it's adventitious, it has to either come from man or come from God. It has to relate to man's natural goals or his his supernatural goals. Easy. But then he does great work defining each one, carefully separating, carefully ex expressing what each one of these things does. Why? Part of why is because the long tradition of Christian reflection about the law has recognized that gross, horrible, damaging errors comes from missing these distinctions, not understanding them, and confusing them. If you confuse these things, you make these horrible errors. Junius' immediate goal is to prepare us to read God's law. He's going to prepare us to read the divine law, and he's going to use these categories. When you're reading the divine law, of course, your goal is the eternal law. When you're reading the, the divine law, it's important to understand what's revealed in the divine law about the natural law, what's revealed in the divine law about our supernatural end, what's revealed in the, the divine law about how God applied natural law to the particular situation of the Jews, how he led Moses to be a perfect human lawmaker. You need to distinguish these categories. If you wrap them all up together, you may make errors like the Anabaptists made. If you confuse these categories of law, you will read scripture poorly. If you understand these distinctions of law, then you will read scripture accurately. It's necessary to understand these, these things in order to be good readers of Mosaic law. That's Junius's point. But I just pause here to remind you, it's also important to understand these categories to avoid vast catastrophic errors like those errors we've seen in totalitarianism or in modern liberalism or in secular humanism or in anarchism. All of these things are real going concerns. Vast nations of millions and millions of people have made these errors and suffered from the consequences. We want to be able to address these errors by having clear conceptual distinctions, and also by being able to define and differentiate those, those terms. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the wisdom of Junius. We thank you for the way that, that he studied the scriptures and was able to, to make these uh, distinctions and the fine logical and rational mind you gave him. We pray, Lord, that, that we will understand them and that we will able, be able to help guide men to understand the law correctly and to understand the word of God as he did.
Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.